Okay, so since this is a foldable, I usually do this under a document camera, but I didn't have my document camera set up and I had a meeting this morning, first period that I forgot about because I didn't even know it was Tuesday. Um, so we're just going to struggle through it this way, which will be fine. So if you look at the what's on the front of this, and it says PD and then RAT squared EY, so PD rating, right? Or um, I did have friends that would call it ratui, which all I could think about was the mouse, ratatui, and I didn't understand, but now I do. It's like rat to e, whatever. But um, so we're just going to call it rating, PD rating. And we're going to start with what the PD stands for. So PD stands for point discontinuity. And then underneath this, we are going to write RADI because we're going to call this, this little acronym is PD RADI to help us with what, and there is a square on the T. Oh, sorry, I can't write. PD RADI. Okay. But the PD part of it stands for point discontinuity. Now, the great majority, actually all of what we are writing on this little foldable, we already know. There's no new information. One thing on there we talked about just a teeny tiny bit. It's still not technically new, but I know we're not super, super clear on it yet, and that's okay. Um, so open this little door and see if this will behave for me. So inside that little door, let's talk about what PD is. So once again, this is point discontinuity. Got my eye. Discontinuity. So if I have point discontinuity, what's actually appearing on my graph? A hole. So also known as a hole and as removable discontinuity. Okay. So point discontinuity is a type of removable discontinuity. Those words can be used interchangeably. And then we know, because we've talked about this quite a bit, that that means we have factor or factors containing x that are common to the numerator and denominator. Okay. So like I said, we're just kind of putting all this information in one place because it's going to help us come up with everything we need to actually graph these or to take a graph and write an equation from it. But there's point discontinuity in a nutshell. We good with that? All right, so then we start on the RADI part of that. So the R stands for roots. What's another word for roots? Zeros or x-intercepts or solutions. I mean, there's all kinds of words, but our roots are our zeros. So then when you open that little door, okay. So the roots are the x-intercepts which are the zeros of the numerator. So remember, they are the zeros of the function as a whole but they're the zeros of the numerator. You can completely ignore the denominator and just find the zeros of the numerator. As long as you, you do it in the correct order, it has to be found after reducing. So you get rid of that. That's why we put PD first, point discontinuity, and then everything else. As long as you have canceled out whatever makes the whole, then it's just the zeros of the numerator. You ignore the denominator. Okay, everybody okay with that? All right, so that's the R part of RADI. The A stands for asymptotes, but only the vertical. The other ones we'll talk about in a different little door. Vertical asymptotes. So in order to have a vertical asymptote, 
we have a unique factor, okay? And the reason it's unique is means that it wasn't common to the numerator and denominator because we would have already canceled those out anyway, right? Um, unique factor containing x found where? In the denominator. And remember, these are asymptotes, so these are lines. We talk, the, talk about them as lines. We use them as lines. Lines determined by the zeros of the denominator. Okay. So zeros of the numerator give us zeros of the function. Zeros of the denominator give us our vertical asymptotes. Okay, we agree with that? Like I said, not brand new information, just kind of putting it in a little foldable here. All right. So back over here, your next door is the T squared. And so this stands for two things. That's why there's a square on it. That's one reason why there's a square on it. There's another one. But, but then I'll explain to you what those two things are. But the T stands for two things. All right, so over here, there we go. It says, do any factors of the R or A have a blank? Okay, so the R stands for what? Roots, and the A stands for asymptotes. And we know that the roots come from the numerator, asymptotes come from the denominator, right, as far as the vertical ones are concerned. So do any factors basically of the numerator or denominator or from the roots or the vertical asymptotes have an even exponent? Because if they do, then special things happen. So if we have an even exponent in the numerator, this example just has a, a squared, but it could be to the fourth, to the sixth, to the eighth, it doesn't matter as long as it's even. Um, so in the numerator, then we have tangency just like we did for polynomials. Okay, So it could look like this. That just means I have a bounce. It's going to bounce off the at the zero, wherever it may be. Okay, that's your tangency. It'd be tangent to the x-axis. If I have an even exponent on a factor in the denominator, then that gives me togetherness. And this is the part that we talked about just very, very briefly last week when it came up. Okay, and then we're going to draw three little examples here. And that togetherness is happening around an asymptote, a vertical asymptote. So let's draw in these little vertical asymptotes here. So that means that it could look like this, togetherness on the either side of the asymptote, or like this. But then this is not togetherness. So I'm going to circle with a line through it. Sometimes, I think it's good sometimes to have what it's not also. It helps you with more than just what it is sometimes. But togetherness means we're going in the same direction on either side of the asymptote. It is possible for a function to have tangency and togetherness in the same function. That's totally possible. Okay, But um, this is just two examples of and so that little square on the T, that could kind of give you a little hint that that's what we're looking for, for an even exponent there. Okay, we good on that? Tangency and togetherness? All right. So now we're on to the E. E stands for end behavior. Like the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x equals blank, whatever. But that's just the left-hand side. We also have the right-hand side. We just don't need to write them all. I don't know how much room you have. Okay. End behavior. So our vertical asymptotes help us with middle behavior, right? Our horizontal and slant asymptotes help us with the end behavior, what's happening way out at the infinities. So let's talk about in behavior. We got some options here. First thing, horizontal asymptotes. So HA for horizontal asymptote. 
If my function is top heavy, what's my horizontal asymptote? Okay, let's come back to that. What if it's bottom heavy? Y equals zero. What if it's tied in degree? The ratio. Then Y equals the ratio of the leading coefficients, and that it goes on to say the rest of that. Okay, so let's go back to top heavy. What's top heavy? None. Okay. There's always a little hesitation on that until we go back to the others, and you're like, oh yeah, it's none. So thinking about them together is good. Top heavy, bottom heavy, tight in degree. If you always think about them together, it's easier to kind of get them lined out to what's going on. But if it is top heavy, I don't have a horizontal asymptote, but that opens the door for my slant asymptote, right? What's another word for a slant asymptote? Think about your abs. What is it? Oblique. So just top heavy in general doesn't guarantee a slant asymptote. It can only be how much more in the numerator? One. So the degree of the numerator is one greater than the denominator. Then we divide and ignore the remainder, right? Then we have other end behavior. So if the degree of the numerator is more than one, more than one, higher than the denominator, Okay. Then if it's more than one, we don't have a slant asymptote, right? Then it has polynomial in behavior. And remember, that is where we just divide the leading terms. And when I divide them, if I get x cubed, my in behavior is like a cubic. If I get x squared, my in behavior is like a squared, okay? And so I just divide the leading terms. to determine the polynomial. So here's my take on this other in behavior and what you're actually going to be responsible for knowing and understanding. From everything that I have seen and I have read and I've tried to figure out, I don't think that when you're having to graph it or even writing an equation, this the other in behavior will necessarily come up. Okay, because I know this is the part that you're going to have a little bit harder time wrapping your mind around. Um, but I could see it coming up in a multiple choice question where it asks you what type of end behavior it has and you would have to know to divide the leading terms and know that it would have, you know, like a cubic end behavior in which way it goes. But as far as writing the equations and graphing it, I don't, I can't see this coming up. If it does, we'll make sure that we get there. But just, a, I think a very basic understanding on this side of it, but the horizontal and slant we need to understand a little bit better. Okay, we okay with all that? All right, so last one is the Y. And that stands for y-intercepts. Okay. The y-intercept. And you've been finding y-intercepts forever. So we should be able to fill in the sentence. We substitute what in for what? Zero in for x. Then do what? Solve for y. And it's written as an ordered pair. If you're asked for an intercept, officially that means ordered pair. All right, what questions you got? Okay, so go ahead while I hand out the next thing that we need and you can tape this down on page 43. So you can just put like, open the little doors and um, put a piece of tape at the top and bottom. And remember, PPD Rady. Don't tape your doors closed because that wouldn't make any sense. Again, check your neighbors. Yes. No, the next one's going on 44. Yeah, so once you did have that, then grab this. It's going on page 44 and we're done. We'll give you a chance to get it taped.
getting there? Okie dokie. All right, so next piece of paper is going on page 44. And where this is equivalent representations of rational functions. So we can be given an equation, and then we can write it in a factored form, non-factored form. We could have a graph for it. We could have a table for it. We could have other information for it. All these different things could represent the same function. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to read what comes after recall. Read this first line to yourself. Make See if you can make it make sense and think about what it's saying. Then we're going to talk about it. Okay, so I guarantee you, every single one of you totally know what that's talking about right there. But because it's in function notation with these variables and stuff, some of y'all are going to read that and be like, that makes no sense to me. So let's think about what this actually says. So we have this function, h of x, it's equal to f of x over g of x, right? This says if g of c equals 0, so that means the denominator would equal 0, right? So if the denominator equals zero, then this function has a vertical asymptote or a hole at x equals c, at whatever number made the denominator equal to zero. Does that make sense to you? Because I want you need to be able to read things like this and not make it make your brain like fizzle out because of just all the variables. If I change the c to a five, then it would make it so much easier for you, right? So you need to be able to kind of think through that yourself. So if g of five equals zero, so if the denominator equals zero, then the function has a vertical asymptote or a hole at x equals 5. That makes sense, right? Even for yourself, maybe re replacing a variable with a number just to wrap your mind around it. Okay, so we're basically talking about vertical asymptotes and holes here, which, again, that's a recall we already, we already know. We've already talked about it a ton. Okay, so let's look at example 1. We have this function. It says write an equation for h of x in factored form and find any values of x where it has a whole or a vertical asymptote. So it's not even asking us for the whole ordered pair of the whole, or the entire ordered pair of the whole, just the x value. So factored form. Here's my function. I'm going to factor it. In the numerator, is that pretty easy to factor? Yes. That becomes x plus 2 times x minus 2. Good. The denominator, I've got x and x. The 10 is positive, so the signs are the same. The 7 is positive, so they're both positive. What are my two numbers? 5 and 2. Good. x plus 5 and x plus 2. Okay. So since I have this as my factored form, do I have any holes? Yes. Okay. I can cancel that out right there. So my hole is at x equals what? Negative 2. So then my simplified form here is x minus 2 over x plus 5. So then do I have a vertical asymptote? Yes, it comes from the denominator, right? So this is at x equals negative 5. Okay, so my domain. Rational functions use all of the real numbers unless there is a vertical asymptote or a hole. So these two things here are the two things that are going to mess up my domain, okay? Because I do not get to have an x value when x is negative 2, and I do not get to have an x value when x is equal to 5. So my domain can start out here at negative infinity. I get to use all the numbers till I get to that vertical asymptote of negative 5. Then I get to start back over on the other side of that asymptote, go all the way to where there's a hole, then start back over on the other side of that hole and go to infinity. Right? That makes sense? Could we write it in set notation? Yes. I think maybe interval notation is better than that in general, but we could say x equals the set of all x's such that x cannot equal negative 5 or negative 2. Even though the interval notation you have to write out a little bit more, I think it might be better for you wrapping your mind around and getting it done correctly. What questions you got? You good? Okay. So now we are going to actually use our PD 
ready concept here to make sure that we have everything we need to graph this function that we need to graph. All right, so they gave us this function. It says write the equation k of x in factored form. So that means I'm going to have k of x equals, then in the numerator, I've got x and x. 12 is negative, so the signs are opposite. What's my positive number? 3, good, and that means the negative one is 4. In the denominator, I have a GCF of x that I can factor out, so I'm going to go ahead and put my x there. Then instead of rewriting it a ton of times, now I'm just going to look at it as if the x is factored out, because it shouldn't make it that much harder. Then I will have this, they'll give me x and x. The 20 is negative, so the signs are opposite. What's my positive number? 5, and the negative 1 is 4. Okay, everybody with me? Got to be able to factor accurately, efficiently. Now, I also want you to notice the difference between what I wrote here in purple and what I wrote here in purple. Here, because k of x was already there, I just wrote the fraction itself. Here, I need an equation, so I put that k of x there. You can't just, just write this part. You have to have an entire equation. There, it was just kind of already set up for me. So make sure that you're not being sloppy with your notation for sure. Okay. So then the next thing that is asked of me is um, any zeros. Now, are zeros the first thing I should be looking for? What's the first thing I should be looking for? Point discontinuity. So that's where, this is, that's where the hole is, right? So this is the PD part of this. This is what I really need to start with first so I don't mess anything up. Okay? So do I have any point discontinuity? Yes, I do. I can cancel these out, right? So that happens at x equals 4. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Then the next thing is my r. What does r stand for? Roots. Okay, so that's where my zeros are, right, right here. So I'm using my reduced function. How many roots do I have? Just one. I can rewrite it. This is k of x is equal to x plus 3 over x times x plus 5, right? So my roots are my zeros. That's the zeros of the numerator. So I only have 1, and that's at x equals negative 3. Okay, we agree with that? Vertical asymptotes, how many do I have? 2. I have 1 at x equals negative 5, and 1 at x equals 0. That's the a part of radii. Okay, so then I have t squared. Do I have any tangency or togetherness? Do I have any factors that have an exponent of an even exponent? No, the factors themselves don't. Yes, if I multiply this out, I end up with an x squared, but that's not a factor. Does that make sense? It would have to be after I factored it, if this was x plus 5 squared, or if this was x plus 3 quantity squared, then it would work. So I don't have any of that. E is my end behavior which is my horizontal asymptotes, right, or slant asymptotes. Um, is this function top heavy, bottom heavy, or tied in degree? Bottom heavy. So I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals what? Zero. Good. Then I need to find the domain. So the things that affect the domain are the vertical asymptotes and the holes. These two things right here. Vertical asymptotes and the holes. So I would start at negative infinity. I get to use all the x, x values until I get to negative 5. Then I start over on the other side of negative 5. And I get to go all the way to 0. Then I start over on the other side of 0. And I get to go to... 4, then I go from 4 to infinity, right? If I have three things, 
three x values that are affecting the domain, then I'm going to have four intervals there. Okay. What questions do you have? And be very careful on this vertical asymptote so that you don't forget about this guy here. Okay. So the thing that is missing from this point, or from Rady, what have I not done? The y-intercept. So my y-intercept is going to be k of 0. Okay, so that means I can substitute this in. It's going to give me 3 over 0 times 5. So what's my y-intercept? Is it 0? No, it's undefined. So I don't have any. Okay, there's no y-intercept. It'll make sense once we graph it. So because we are going to graph it, and all it said was find the values of x for the whole, I actually need to know exactly where the whole is. Well, it would help me if I knew that. Um, so I want to find the actual ordered pair here with the x value being 4. So I want to find k of 4. That's going to give me 4 plus 3, which is 7, over 4 times 9. So that's 7 over... 36, right? So my y value is 7 over 36. We are graphing it on this little tiny grid here. Do you think we have to be crazy accurate? No. So 7 over 36 is really close to 6 over 36, right? Which is like 1 sixth, which is like barely any. That's all you really need to know. It's just a little bit, okay? So I got to know to be able to graph it. All right, so let's go put some of these things on our graph. So let's start with Let's start with the asymptotes, I guess. So I have a vertical asymptote at negative 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'm a fan of always putting the asymptotes on things first. And I have a vertical asymptote at 0. You see why now we don't have a y-intercept? If I have a vertical asymptote on the y-axis, I can't have a y-intercept. And then I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So I got my asymptotes on there. Then I want to get my any zeros I have. I have one at x equals negative 3. So at negative 3, I have a 0, which tells me that I do cross that horizontal asymptote, right? And then I have a hole at 4 and comma, 7 36ths. So I go to 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. And it's like, I can't make mine super small up here, but you know, it's just like right above the x-axis. Good enough just to show that we have a hole there. So let's talk about some things that I know about this graph. Okay, that's all I can actually put on there from all that information that I found, but that's a lot of stuff so far. I know because I have vertical asymptotes that of the asymptote, I have to either be going to infinity or negative infinity, right? I also know I don't have any togetherness, so I'm not going to be going in the same direction on either side of the asymptotes, um, but I don't know which direction I'm supposed to be going, right? That's, that's a problem right now, especially since I can cross and I'm going to cross. This doesn't guarantee that this does, I mean, this might be going, I can't do it without touching it, might be going up here to infinity, but it also could cross, like I don't know. So what do I do to help me figure out if my graph is positive or negative in different spots? The what? The sign chart. Yes, very good. So I'm going to rewrite the function down here so I can see it. k of x is equal to, what was it? It was x plus 3 over x times x plus 5. All right. Okay. I just want to be able to see it here. So we're going to do a sign chart. On the sign chart goes the asymptotes and the zeros. So I have negative 5, negative 3, 0. All right, choose something less than negative 5, like negative 6. Numerator gives me negative, then negative, then negative. That's negative overall. Between negative 5 and negative 3, I can do negative 4. That would give me negative, negative, positive. That's positive overall. 
Negative one would give me positive, negative, positive. That's negative overall. Positive one would give me positive, positive, positive. That's positive overall. So here's what this tells me. I know my function is negative here, positive here, negative here, positive here. Right. So from negative infinity to negative five, my function is negative the entire time. And I know next to, I don't get to just stop right before a vertical asymptote, and I don't get to go through it because you can't cross it. So I have to, by, by a vertical asymptote, I have to be going to negative infinity or positive infinity. So since it's negative until we get to negative five, I know my function has to look something like this. Not only that, but since it is negative the entire time, I know for a fact it's not going to cross that horizontal asymptote, even though that's a, that's a thing that could happen. From negative five to negative three, my function is positive, which makes sense because I don't have any togetherness, right? So from negative five to negative three, I'm positive. From negative three to zero, it's negative. So it has to be hugging this asymptote from here and this one to here. So the only thing that makes sense to be able to go through that is to look something like this. Okay, so we have a point of inflection there because it's the only way you can kind of, because it's not going to be a straight line because it would poke through. It's got to look something like that and have that kind of cubic uh, behavior there. Then I know from um, zero to infinity, it's positive. Okay, so again, it makes sense because I don't have any togetherness. I have to start up here. I'm going to have that hole right there. And again, I know I'm not crossing that horizontal asymptote because it's positive the whole time and it looks something like this. And there's my function. If we were graphing quadratics, we had this information, you would know going in that it's gonna look like a parabola. You just gotta figure out where it is and what direction it's going and how fat or skinny it is, right? With rationals, you don't have a clue. I've, I've graphed a bazillion of these. I still don't have a clue when I look at it. Not until you start putting things on here and then it just kinda of comes together in the end. It's like putting a puzzle together and then it just appears in front of you because there's only certain things that you can sketch in, okay? But those are going to get better and better as, you know, it takes a little bit of practice on those. Okay, we okay so far? What questions we got? All right, flip it over. So now we're going to, we're given the graph, we're going to write an equation. So in order to come up with everything, we're going to do the PD radii part, but this time we're getting it from a graph instead of an equation, okay? All right, so when you look at this function, do you have any point discontinuity? Yes, can you tell me exactly what the x value is? Yes, do you know exactly what the y value is? No, that would be a guess, so we're just gonna go with what we can do here, and so my, the point discontinuity is where x equals four, right? All right, how many roots do we have? One, okay, so that's going to be at x equals what? Three. All right, do I have any vertical asymptotes? Yes, that's at x equals two. Do I have any tangency or togetherness? No, so this is a none. So my end behavior, where is my y-intercept? No, I'm sorry, not my y-intercept. Where is my horizontal asymptote? y equals negative one, and then my y-intercept, I have one, do I know exactly where it is without guessing? No, so we're just like, we don't have anything there because we don't want to guess, we can only go with what we know for sure, okay? Now, this is writing, notice it says write an equation, not the equation, meaning this, this might not be the, the actual equation itself because we could have some other things going on that we couldn't check, but it's going to be, you know, pretty darn close. Get everything in there that we actually can. So this is called f of x. Then we go through here and put our stuff in. So I have point discontinuity at x equals 4. That means I have a factor that is x minus 4, right? So I put the factor in the numerator. Where else does it need to be? The denominator. Good. I have a root at x equals 3. So my factor is what? 
x minus 3, and it goes where? Numerator. Does it also go in the denominator? No. Could I have x minus 3 squared in the numerator and just x in the denominator? I mean, I'm sorry, just x minus 3 and they cancel out? That could happen, but we don't, we don't know that for sure, okay? Um, all right, so then the asymptote, that would mean I have an x minus 2 where? Denominator, x minus 2. Then I don't have any tangency or togetherness, so that means I don't have to go and put any squares on my factors, okay? Then I have n behavior at y equals negative 1. Ooh. So if that's the case, is my function top heavy, bottom heavy, or tied in degree? Tied in degree. Currently, are we tied in degree? Yes, okay. Um, but if I did the ratio of the leading coefficients, would I get negative 1? No, okay, so am I done? No, now, I could fix this a lot of different ways. I could put negative 2 in the numerator and 2 in the denominator. I could put 50 in the numerator and negative 50 in the denominator, right? There's like an infinite amount of things I could actually do, but we don't have to get fancy and weird about it. I can just put a negative in either the numerator or denominator. Now, would that give me an in behavior of y equals negative 1? Turn that off. Would that give me a y equals negative 1? It would, right? And so then that's good enough. Do we know for sure that this function graphs that exact thing? Not right now, no. Okay. We good? What questions you got? Okay, good deal. All right, so then I want you on this next one to fill in your PD ready. And then this is G of X, so fill that in and give you a minute to do that. And then once you've got your PD ready filled in, Check with your neighbors, see if you agree. You can consult with them as you're doing this, and then see if you can get an equation written after you do all that. Okay, so I just had the question about if there was a horizontal asymptote and y equals zero, then wouldn't we see a dotted line here? And the answer is, would I put it? Yes. Would I expect you to put it? Yes, because that's showing what you know. Um, is it gonna show up on every graph? No. Sometimes the vertical asymptotes don't even actually show up. Um, same thing here, because we do we have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero? Yes, and we know that because of the um, of what's happening on either side of it, right? And so, and there is, yes, there is one right here as well. That's a very good question. And then there's also this one, of course. So, good question. All right, so do we have point discontinuity? Yes, x equals two. How many roots do we have? One. X equals one. Um, how many asymptotes do we have? Two. Vertical asymptotes. Two. So I've got X equals zero and X equals three. Right. Do I have any tangency or togetherness? No. There's none there. So my in behavior, Y equals what? And then my y-intercept here, I can actually say that I know for sure that I have none. I had one on the other one, I just couldn't tell you exactly where it was. All right, so then when we put this together, point discontinuity, that gives me x minus 2 here, x minus 2 here. Roots, x minus 1. Asymptotes, put x, and then x minus 3, right? No tangents here, togetherness. The only other thing I have to check is my in behavior. If y equals zero, if, if that's my horizontal asymptote, am I top heavy, bottom heavy, or tied in degree? Bottom heavy. Is what I have right here bottom heavy? Yes, then that is an acceptable equation, and we're good. Okay? What questions you got? All right, so go ahead and get that taped in on page 44. Um, there's not an assignment today because we didn't finish. There's still one more page of notes that goes with this. Um, I don't want to push it all in one day. Okay, any questions? Awesome.